Welcome to the 11th district episode of our Mosaic series, celebrating the diverse communities of the mosaic we call Santa Monica. In this, our fourth season, we're focusing on the founding families who helped shape Santa Monica. And tonight we're reaching all the way back to our very first community of families, the ancient Tongva village of Kuravanga and its sacred springs that still exist today. The Gabrielino Tongva people occupied Southern California for more than 10,000 years. And we have built our modern existence on their land. After centuries of exploitation and erasure, the Gabrielino Tongva are beginning to receive the recognition they deserve as the past, present, and future caretakers of the unceded territory of Southern California. Our program tonight will offer a brief history of the Tongva people and the most observable evidence of, of the population at the Curavinga Springs, which is located on the campus of University High School in West LA. Bob Ramirez, president of the Gabrielino Tongva Springs Foundation, will trace the history of the thriving village and the springs that provided it fresh water. He will also explain how the springs inspired the naming of Santa Monica and served as an early source of its water supply. Indige indigenous archeologist Desiree Martinez will offer a close up view of daily life at a typical Tongva village like Coravonga, from favorite foods and recreational activities to spiritual practices. Ramirez will return to tell the modern story of Coravonga, from its rescue to ongoing efforts to restore and enrich the site. The program will be followed by a Q&A session for our viewers, and you can submit your questions using the chat box at the bottom of your screen, Zoom screen. Program will continue with remarks from Santa Monica Conservancy President Tom Clays and Rob Schwenker, who is the uh, Executive Director of the Santa Monica History Museum our co-sponsor of this program. Besides being the president of the Gabrielino Tonga Springs Foundation, Bob Ramirez is the CEO of Ramirez Designs Inc., which, can, which plans and designs custom houses and gardens in our local community. He is currently engaged in creating a, a memorial garden at the Mission San Gabriel in honor of the original inhabitants of California. Desiree Martinez has dedicated her life to obtaining the skills and knowledge to combat the wanton destruction of Native American sac sacred and cultural sites, particularly her own community of the Tongva. She is the president of Cog Stone Research Management and co-director of the Pimu Catalina Island Archaeological Program. Now, will you please uh, welcome Bob Ramirez. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Libby, and thank you, uh, Conservancy, for being interested and in having us on this program. And uh, I think we'd like to start with uh, some slides, and we're going to go back in time to the very beginning of, uh, of the people that arrived here on this, or that have been here since time immemorial, I should say, at least 10,000 years. And uh, I don't have the control in front of me for the slide, so I'm just gonna say next slide to advance. Um, the, the people that were, uh, came down or that have been living on the Channel Islands uh, were adept seafarers and they would create plank canoes such as the one depicted here. The Tongva would call this a tiat, whereas the Chumash would call this tomol. Uh, the Chumash are our neighbors to the north, but they speak a distinct language. And uh, there is quite a lot of interconnection and trade. Next slide. This is a, a beautiful aerial view of Catalina Island showing, uh, looking toward the West End, showing the Isthmus, Little Harbor, Cat Harbor on the left and the Isthmus on the right. Uh, this was a, a site of many ancient villages, which uh, Desiree will, uh, will talk about. Uh, next slide. 
this lovely map kind of depicts uh, the trade routes and the village sites of the Chumash indicated in blue, the Tongva with the red and uh, the Ajachaman further south with the orange. You can see Catalina is the center of trade for uh, for all these uh, visitors or all these uh, all the indigenous people and the uh, artifacts that were uh, taken or that were, uh, excuse me, the the uh, soapstone, the, the uh, steatite vessels, abalone shells were were traded throughout the whole southwest of the United States uh, with origins in Catalina Island. And uh, next slide. This is a depiction of a typical coastal village or maybe on the side of the river showing the tiats and the uh, huts that we call keys that were made of willow branches and tule reed thatch. Next. Uh, this is a depiction of what is now Westchester. Uh, Guasti was the, not Guasti, uh, Wanga was the name of this village. You can see the background, there's Point Doom and on the foreground, uh, children playing in the water with uh, the kinds of activities that one would have encountered uh, in probably in June of 1769. Next slide. In 1542, however, Joao Rodriguez Cabrillo, who was uh, either a Portuguese or a Spanish navigator, made his way up the coast uh, to explore the California coast for the first time for Europeans. Uh, he was injured on Catalina Island, and he died of his injuries, and we believe he's buried on San Miguel Island. But that name, Cabrillo, you see popping up throughout uh, coastal California. Um, next slide. In 1700, this is a map from 1700. They still did not really understand the geography of the West Coast, and California was depicted as an island. Um, it came, the, the name of California actually traces back to Arabic language from the word caliph, as in caliphate. And it was used in, uh, in a Spanish novel in the 1500s to describe a mythical island inhabited by Amazons at the far end of the Indies. Uh, they did explore the coast of Baja. That's why it is mapped in pretty good detail, but it got fuzzy as they went further up the coast. And uh, interestingly, California, because it's such a difficult place to get to uh, by sea and overland was almost impossible in those days, it was left untouched for hundreds of years while the rest of New Spain, uh, Mexico particularly, was, uh, was developed for hundreds of years. Next. In 1579, Francis Drake happened to stop by the coast of California and careened his vessel, the Golden Hind, up uh, up in an area we call Drake's Bay, where we believe, and he claimed California for the for the uh, for the Queen of England. Next slide. And this is this is a picture that I took from a globe in uh, in the estate of Althorpe in England. It's from 1750, and it shows the California is no longer an island. However, it's completely blank and unexplored. And because this is an English globe, they call it Nova Albion, New Albion, New England. And you can see it gets fuzzy up above Cape Mendocino. Um, but like I said, the Europeans sort of left it alone for several hundred years until, uh, until the Russians started coming down the coast uh, from Alaska. Next slide. And because of the Russian incursions and the English designs, the King of England uh, decided to send a land expedition to stake their claim of Alta California. And on August 4th, 1769, this expedition arrived at the village of Kuruvunga. It's recorded in uh, Father Juan Crespi's diary. Next slide. And Father Crespi recounts that as we arrived and set up camp, six very friendly, compliant, tractable heathens, meaning non-believers, came over who had their little houses roofed with grass, the first we have been seeing of this sort. Three of them came wearing a great deal of paint, all of them, however, unarmed. They brought four or six bowls of usual seeds and good sage, which they, which they presented to our captain. On me, they bestowed a good-sized string of beads. 
um, they these explorers were very impressed with the sophistication and the friendliness of, of these local inhabitants. Um, next slide. When they came back from uh, their travels up north to find the Monterey Bay, uh, which they really didn't recognize, um, instead they stumbled upon the San Francisco Bay. In, uh, in after visiting Kuruvungna, they actually discovered the bay by walking all the way up to coastal range until they ran out of uh, mountain range. They, uh, they came back and gathered up the natives from this area, from Catalina Island, from uh, what is now Los Angeles County, and uh, encouraged, compelled, forced them to relocate to the San Gabriel Valley to build the mission San Gabriel Arcangel. And the first mission was built down in Whittier Narrows in 1772. And the natives recommended they not, they not build there because it was uh, going to flood out, which it did. And in 1775, they moved the mission to its current location. Uh, what I love about this painting uh, is the view of Mount Baldy in the background and this majestic regal key that we see in the foreground on the right with, with the natives uh, mingling with the Spanish and um, the water coming down from the San Gabriel being funneled between the mission uh, uh, buildings here for irrigation purposes and the big outdoor uh, atrio, they call it, facing the mission where natives would be gathered for mass baptisms. Sadly, most of the natives perished uh, because of disease, mistreatment, and um, the destruction of their native ways. Uh, there are reputed to be 6,000 Indians buried in the San Gabriel Mission. Um, next slide. The, uh, the Spanish crown and the mission lands were confiscated by the revolutionary Mexicans when Mexico became a republic as they declared their war of independence against Spain. Uh, the, the war lasted uh, quite, a, quite a while. Um, but this is this painting I love because it shows the uh, revolutionary Miguel Hidalgo, who was a Catholic priest, uh, using the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe, who's a depiction of an Indian woman as a manifestation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she was the rallying cry for the native people of Mexico to rise up against the uh, colonial oppressors. Unfortunately, uh, the mission lands that were promised to the Indians were taken and distributed to the well-heeled aristocrats of Alta California. Next slide. This is the diseño or a, uh, a patent land uh, uh, depiction of the, the Santa Monica Bay on the left, the Santa Monica mountain range. And right in the foreground to the right, it says Ojo de Agua. These are the springs. This was the land, the land grant for the Rancho San Vicente y Santa Monica, which was given to Don Francisco Sepulveda in 1839. Next. This is uh, his brother, Jose Andres Sepulveda. I couldn't find uh, Francisco's picture, but I think we get the idea. Um, he was the brother and who was the grantee of this, uh, of this land. I think it was 35,000 acres that encompassed a large portion of the Santa Monica mountain range. Next. This is a romantic image of the Rancho days in California showing the San Gabriel mission in the right center and the upper left, the San Fernando mission. Now, uh, the natives that were taken to the San Gabriel mission and were baptized became essentially property of the mission and they were referred to as Gabrieleños. If you were taken to the San Fernando mission, you became a Fernandino. Or if you were Chumash and, and were hauled to the Santa Barbara mission, you became a Barbareño. Uh, this, the red line shows the, the, uh, the, um, the trail of the uh, El Camino Real, which was the path that the Spanish used to link the missions a day's ride apart. And you can see uh, our Santa Monica Bay uh, just above that rearing horse and a friendly friar with his crucifix. And uh, I think things looked pretty happy back then for a few years. Next. 
However, in 1847, uh, the Americans, under the concept of manifest destiny, which meant that God gave them this land, um, were able to take half of Mexico, all of Alta California, all the way to the Pacific coast. And the native Californios put up a fight, put up a struggle, won a few battles, lost the war. This is the Treaty of Cahuenga, which, by the way, Cahuenga is another Tongva word, like Tahunga and Topangna and Cucamonga. Next slide. I, I like this picture. It's the Sepulveda brothers and Antonio Yorba from 1850, right at the time of statehood, as they prepared to leave for school in Boston. Next slide. In 1852, our first governor of California, his name was Peter Hardiman Burnett. He was a slave owner from Missouri. He became the governor of the state of California and he gave a speech to the legislature declaring that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct. And uh, the legislature of California would pay bounties to, uh, to uh, hunt down the Indians, uh, especially in the North in the gold country. Uh, in the South, the Mission Indians uh, pretty much had to hide their identity and submerge themselves as Mexicans so they would not get uh, uh, taken to the slave market, which actually existed in downtown Los Angeles for many years. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in more of this um, American genocide, there's a wonderful book called American Genocide, which is not taught in fourth grade, but it's worth having a visit to this period of history. Between 1852 and 1872, the federal government was occupied with uh, the secession of the states, and uh, they weren't really able to uh, protect the Indians uh, until like I say, around 1872, when they started to make treaties and uh, give little rancherias for the surviving Indians so that the white settlers could uh, take the very uh, rich lands of California. The treaties between the Tongva and the, and the state government were sent to the federal government, but never ratified. They were lost, misplaced, and rediscovered 50 years later in a drawer in the Library of Congress. Uh, the natives were promised the Cajon or the Tahone Ranch, which is uh, up near the Great Five, 55,000 acres. This was going to be the homeland for the Tongva. After kicking them out of Beverly Hills and Santa Monica, they were going to send them, uh, you know, to that windswept plain. However, the Indian agent kept it for himself. So the Tongva ended up with no federal, with no land at all. And as a result, were unable to ever achieve federal recognition. Next this is a, one of the survivors that we now know was a Gabriel, well, we would not call her Gabrieleno, but she was Tongva, uh, believed to be the lone woman of San Nicolas Island from the island of the Blue Dolphins. After 17 years, she was picked up from the island, brought to Santa Barbara, and uh, speaking, speaking uh, a language that the Chumash did not understand. And it turned out that she was uh, Tongva speaking, Utah has taken speaking uh, person that lived maybe for one month in Santa Barbara uh, before she perished of unfamiliar food, probably disease, but what a tough survivor. Next. So when the, when the uh, state of California was created, they, they respected some of the land grants from the Rancho days, but they had to be uh, patented and uh, proven by surveyors and lawyers. And a lot of the land grants were broken up uh, the San Vicente land was divided up and sold to the Santa Monica Land and Water Company. Um, in this map, which I find quite interesting, the upper part of the map, you'll see two little reservoirs. Those are the springs. And there's a pipeline that's depicted following the contours coming right down to where Douglas Park is today, corner of 25th and Wilshire Boulevard. And uh, I want to thank Nina Fresco for this wonderful map. The next slide. Uh, this is another survivor of the Tongva. Uh, this was taken in 1905. And uh, Narcisa Higuera was one of the last fluent Tongva speakers. And she was a source for uh, Seahart Merriman, who recorded and tried to um, get as much information as possible on this culture. Next. 
University High School was built on the grounds of Kudu Vungna in 1924. They uncovered uh, quite a bit of uh, artifacts and I'm sure human remains. In those days, we did not have the protections of the state of archaeologists and a lot of the uh, artifacts were hauled off. Uh, note the cupola in the center of the building, which came down in an earthquake and uh, is no longer there. Next picture. So this is the famous contentious mural in the city, city hall, um, it, which depicts the arrival of Portola expedition to the springs. Uh, the water flowing from these two springs reminded the Spanish purportedly that of, of the tears of St. Monica, who was a uh, Roman citizen from the fourth century from North Africa. Uh, Monica is actually a Berber name, but she was a pious devout Christian who cried because of her wayward son, Augustine, and her pagan husband, who converted to Christianity on his deathbed. But she is the patron saint of wives and mothers who suffer and cry. So these two pools of water gave the name of the springs and ultimately the name of the city of Santa Monica, the freeway, the bay, the mountain range, and uh, they still exist on the grounds of Uni High. Next. This is uh, the building of Uni High as it exists today without the cupola, uh, sitting on the grounds of what was once the ancient village of Kuduvungna, which according to archeologists, uh, extended for a mile in all directions. Next. In 1992, the early 90s, Angie Barons, among other uh, uh, community members, uh, descendants of the Tongva, uh, alumni of Uni High got involved uh, in order to rescue the springs. They had been abandoned, neglected, uh, and uh, disgraced in a way by by the high school. Uh, they were no they were no longer part of the program. Uh, when Angie showed up for a for an event in the early '90s, she was uh, angered by the condition of the springs, and she and her family just got to work, started cleaning them up, and ultimately, with the help of the community, was able to create the foundation, which has been existing now for 30 years, the Gabilango Tongva Springs Foundation. Next. Senator Tom Hayden at the time was a big advocate of the springs, um, and he was able to secure funding from the state for a task force to come up with recommendations to save this two-acre site. Uh, from further development and to uh, incorporate it into the community so we could all enjoy it. Uh, we were able to build an amphitheater with some of that money and to uh, perform studies of the hydrology. And uh, the recommendations included uh, removing the buildings, removing the concrete and restoring the whole site with native plants and finding a way to use the spring water uh, for irrigation. Next. This is the uh, entrance that we see today from the main parking lot. Next. And uh, when Angie uh, had uh, her program going for, for many years, there were uh, celebrations called Life Before Columbus, where community members would come together. And uh, that's something that we're trying to uh, reestablish and reconnect as we um, reinvigorate the village of Kuruvuna. Next. This is the placard that you'll find on Barrington as you come down Barrington Hill. Uh, this is looking south toward Santa Monica Boulevard. Tongva Sacred Springs, the home of the Gabrielino Tongva people. Thank you, Bob. That was very interesting. And it certainly sets us up for Desiree Mar Martinez, who's going to give us a little more of a bird's eye view of life uh, in a typical Tongva village. Well, thank you for having me and inviting me to tell you a little bit of what, what Tongva life was like in the past and kind of what's going on in the future. Um, on the left-hand side is a drawing made by one of our community members, Gabriel Robles, which is what he envisions a village on Catalina Island, specifically Avalon, would have looked like. And you'll see a number of different drawings from community members within my presentation. But, um, you know, Going on what Bob said, Tongva land includes um, not only the basin of Los Angeles County, but also the four Southern Channel Islands of San Clemente, San Nicolas, Santa Barbara, 
as well as Santa Catalina Island and portions of Orange County, San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And this photo is showing some of the villages that were documented at contact um, as well as through the 17th and 18th centuries as scholars, explorers, and people started to talk to the descendants of the people who lived like Bob said, for 10,000 years within the area. And you'll notice that there's some blank spaces. That's not because we didn't live there, but it's because at this time, um, we know that there's um, places there that people live, but we don't have names for them. And one of the big things when people always ask me or trying to think about is how people identify themselves. They identify themselves via um, based on the village that they're from. And when you look at some of the words that are currently some of the city names that are in Southern California, Los Angeles area, as Bob has already pointed out, um, they are Tongva names. So taking the village community of Yar, um, which is in downtown Los Angeles, the place um, when you see an NGA ending, that's the place of the village. So Yagna, which is what we are calling the village that was in downtown LA. And if you're a person, from Yar, you're a Yavet. Um, and the people from the village of Yar are Yavetam. Um, and so in Santa Monica, the closest uh, village that is there is uh, Pomiagna. And it's in the village uh, vicinity of the Santa Monica Canyon near, if you guys know where the Marquez Cemetery is. And it was one of the last villages to come under the influence of the San Gabriel mission possibly 1801 to 1815. And again, it was village life that really ruled the people that lived um, within Tonga land and Tongva territory. There was no overarching chief or person that ruled over Tonga land. Um, each village has its own leader. They were autonomous. They made their own laws and worked with their own people. Usually the villages could range anywhere from 50 to 500 people, depending on the, the season and the area and if the resources could support that many people, uh, the people that were living in the villages were usually from a few family lineages. So think about your great, great grandparents, their kids, their kids, and their kids' kids. Um, when the village got too big to support a large number of people, then you would have some family mo um, lineages moving out and creating new villages nearby. nearby. And the leader of the um, village would be a, called a Tomyar, and they were in charge of the secular and religious life. And here on the right-hand side, there's a uh, picture drawn by Washoyo Alvitre, who's one of our artists. And this depicts um, a woman. And if you see the, um, it's a, a church um, sword, um, should I say wooden sword with a church piece on top, that was a status symbol. And most of the time it was men who were the chiefs or leaders of the community in terms of the more um, hereditary um, actions. However, women were known chiefs of tribes as well. Um, I just picked uh, Catalina Island. I do a lot of my work, not only in Tonga land here on the mainland, but also on Catalina Island. And this is a picture of Little Harbor. And, um, and I, I show this because just as um, Bob was stating is that when you think about Puravungna Springs, it wasn't just the place of where Uni High is, it extended all around and what I'm calling vi village use area. So there was a place where people would live and then they would go out and there would be places where you would go and gather fish, gather plants for medicine, for foods, you would go out and hunt um, mammals and other things. And so this village use area could be anywhere from a mile to up to five miles, which is what we've documented on Catalina. Um, and that's kind of how you you use the, the landscape. And um, so the this photo right here can show you that um, up on top of the Mesa, there were, that's where the houses were. And then in the sea, you have um, people in Tiats doing the fishing. And then on the shore, um, you would process the fish as well as any of the shellfish that you would collect and then um, uh, eat that shellfish and bring it back up to the village that's up on the mesa. One of the big things when you think about how people live on lands, you have to think about all of the logical uh, uh, 
And that really dictates what you eat, what you wear, and how you live and interact with everything around you. So within Tonga land, we have a number of different ecological zones, the sheltered coast, the exposed coasts, mountains and foothills, prairies and valleys, and the islands. The islands are their own um, way of, of life because they are in the middle of the ocean. So you have a lot of those foodstuffs um, focusing on the marine life. There were no deer, the largest mammals that were um, land mammals on the island, the island would eat, but the animals in, that were available in each of these different ecological zones, as well as the plants really dictated what was collected, what was used to eat, et cetera. Um, one of the, again, like I stated, where you live depended on um, what you wore depended on where you lived. So obviously in the areas where it was hot, um, a lot of us wore less clothes, obviously things made of deer skin, um, rabbit furs, um, et cetera. Uh, you had uh, skirts that were made out of bark cloth. On the islands, you actually had skirts made out of um, seagrass. On the islands, you also had things that were made out of otter skins, otter pelts. Um, most of the time, depending on what you wore, also showed your status. So the more decoratively you were um, uh, dressed in, the more the higher status you were. Uh, the Serrano, who are the tribe that to, are to the east of us, call us the Havakadam, or the beautiful people. And a lot of it had to do with our glimmering jewelry made out of the abalone shells that are shown here on the right. Um, those people that had large shell beads or lots of shell bead necklaces um, because they took a lot of time and effort to create were considered to have a higher status. Um, women had chin tattoos here, they're painted um, so that you can see them a little better, but the chin tattoos would have and tell you the status of the person as well as whether the women were married or not. Um, and again, thinking about um, how we uh, we're depending on where we live, obviously in the winter, you wore more clothes because it was cold. That's one of the things that a lot of our, our elders are trying to fight against is that we were always running around naked. That's how we are depicted in these historical photographs. But in fact, again, we clothed depending on the weather and we weren't, um, we were wearing lots of clothes to keep ourselves warm in the winter. But one of the big things also is in thinking about our relationship with the land, and it's something that we are actually reincorporating or re-identifying ourselves within our community today, is this idea of uh, relational reciprocity and thinking about how we are related to everything around us. And for the Gabalin Otonga, some of the core values is that humans are not above all of the rest of creation. And this was something that was taught to us in our origin stories. The animals are our relatives, the plants are our relatives, the rocks, the water, the ground. And so it's up to us as humans to make sure that all of our relatives around us are living, are able to survive and live within this land. And that if we have to, for instance, take the life of a deer or go and gather, we give an offering and we say thank you. And we always want to make sure that we're not taking too much, that we are always aware that if we destroy something, then that's going to also affect us and affect our survival. So it's really up to us to make sure that there's a give and take relationship and that we're not always giving and making sure we're very conscious of what we're doing. Um, and so because of that, we had a lot of land management practices to make sure that not only are we creating more um, resources and better resources, and I hate to use the term resources, but better things for us to use in order for us to live, but it also helps um, the plants and the animals itself. So we did a lot of prescribed burning. Uh, there's a lot of people that are now looking to our native um, communities to relearn that practice so that we don't have these huge wildfires like we have been having in the last decade, but to start doing smaller burns. And those smaller burns actually, in some instances, um, make the, for instance, deer grass, pine forests, the acorn trees, that burning all of that duff, um, the ash creates nutrients for the, the plant, but then for the little shoots that come up, um, for the regrowth, that's really good for the deer to come and, and other animals to come and eat. 
uh, making sure that if we do go, do go and collect, like I said, we selectively cut and prune. Um, we don't take more than what is needed. And we practice horticulture. So we spread seeds. We didn't necessarily garden, but we tended to the land. We made sure that the areas was clean so that the plants can continue to grow. And if we needed to transplant plants, making sure that um, they were given enough area in order to spread, uh, particularly thinking about medicine plants, um, we took some prunings and took those medicine. And we did have medicine gardens that were nearer or closer to our villages. And uh, this slide shows a little bit about some of the foods. Again, I was talking about that depending on where you're at, uh, will dictate what you're eating, uh, particularly mostly at contact and, and right before we are really dependent on acorns. And although Catalina has uh, the live oak acorn um, uh, oak trees, they're not really good acorns. They're really, really small. And so a lot of what would come over, which I'll talk about that kind of exchange that will what happen the acorn coming to the mainland um, we also had uh, chia seed and the pine nuts are obviously coming from the higher altitude areas in the mountains with the acorns being in the foothills here on the mainland. Um, and some of the pictures that are showing here is how we process um, some of the, the foods. And there was a lot of grinding. So on the right hand side, we have a picture of one of our community members using a mortar and a pestle where we would pound um, are the meats of the seed uh, of the nuts and the seeds in order to get them into a flower. Um, the picture that's in the middle beneath the word food, that's a matate, which is a flat rock, and a mono, which is a rock that's rounded and shaped in the cups of your hand. And you would sit there and grind seeds. And you could actually use that also to crack open the acorn. And when you got acorn meal um, to the consistency and size that you wanted, uh, in the lower right hand corner, you would actually leach the acorn meal to get the tannins and the bitterness out of it. And you would continue to do that until you no longer had that bitterness using fresh water. And this is a picture of us replicating that process in our Catalina Island um, archaeology field school a few years ago. And then that mush would then be um, boiled. And it was, you know, think about cream of wheat or something like that. It would be that kind of, of, of mush. In um, in the middle below the mono and the matate are Catalina Island cherries. So you might think of the nice big juicy cherries that you might get from Washington. And that's not what our Catalina cherries are. They're actually really thin in terms of the meatiness of it. And what we really used was the huge um, seed that was in the middle, which again, we would use um, in a mono and matate um, to kind of crack them open and then put them in the pestle and mortar in order to create that meal. Um, and if we were, and deer ends up being a very important staple as well as rabbit. And again, seafood, particularly on the islands and along the coast is something that was, was eaten by our communities as well. And as I stated, each village was autonomous, but each village was also connected to each other. And this map shows of some historical research that was done by Chester King, who um, is an archaeologist, and looking at the mission records, he's and, and you know the missionaries were really good record keepers, um, and they when somebody was baptized or died, they would collect information about the mother, the father, and the person of what what their native names were, what their converted names were, and what villages they were from. And this map shows marriages um, between the various villages of not only in Tongva territory, but also Serrano and Ch Chumash and uh, Ahachiman and Loseno territory. And the thicker the line is, then the more marriages were documented in the mission period. So if you'll see, um, the thickest, you'll see the red dot, that's Santa Monica area, and that's the village that was in the Santa Monica area, but right next to it is Koshbet, which is the Bayona wetlands. Again, another village that was um, not brought under the mission uh, um, influence until later. That thick line goes all the way to Catalina, um, also known as Pimu in the Gabrielino Tongva language. And so it's interesting to see why is there so many marriages between particular villages 
and not among others. And a lot of it had to do with our belief system of our moieties where you're either part of the wildcat or the coyote family, think about it as, as, as families. And so you couldn't intermarry in the same family. So you have to marry out. And so that's a, a lot of intermarriages happen uh, between community leaders. And one of the reasons that was also important is that if at some point there was some type of travesty or you the village didn't have enough to eat, for instance, you could reach out to your family and say, hey, we need some more resources. We need some food. We're starving. And your family would then send you food, kind of like what we do now um, with other places in the world that might need um, some resources from us. We um, do that. And in essence, hoping that in the future, we have to do that ourselves, that that would be reciprocated. And, um, you know, we didn't allow people to starve our family or our families. And we always wanted to make sure that everybody, again, could survive. Um, one of the big things that would occur is that although the villages were surrounded by resources and would go and hunt within those village use areas, sometimes the villages would come together for collection of acorns, et cetera, uh, or for building boats. And this is actually um, some pictures of us building tule boats. And not only did we have the sewn red plank canoes called tiots, which uh, Bob talked about earlier, and those we use for DC fishing, we did have smaller boats that were made out of these, made out of tules, which we use along the rivers and close to shore in order to to gather to um, to fish to um, hunt birds etc. And so we all came together a few years ago and collected tule and made a tule boat uh, and made cordage. So in the middle you see Craig um, uh, taking off uh, I think it was dog bane uh, the bark of the dog bane stick and then was making cordage in order to lash the Thule bundles together. And in the right hand side, that's my niece. You know, that was the first time we had made a Thule boat in, you know, a hundred years. So we didn't know if it was going to float or not. So we threw her on. Um, she's wearing a life jacket. She knew how to swim. So it wasn't like she was going to sink or anything. But that was one of the first times that the community had got together and, and built something like that. And that's how our ancestors did in the past as well, is they would come together. Somebody was in need. If there was, um, you know, it's easier to gather the acorns all together in a larger group so you could do it within a week, within two weeks, and then start to process if you, what you needed to process and tend um, the area so that it would be ready for the next year. And we continue to do that today as well. Um, not not only was there interaction between the villages on the mainland, but there was huge interaction between the mainland and um, both the southern and uh, northern channel islands, the southern channel islands being inhabited by the Gabrieleno Tongva and the northern channel islands being inhabited by the Chumash. But there were things that were within our territory that weren't available in other territories. And one of those, such as Bob had already um, identified is our soapstone and we were well known for our soapstone bowls and and um, items that were coming off um, the island and on the lower right hand corner is one of our quarries of soapstone outcroppings and you can see little circular divots and actually some nubs that are still there and those are um, they were about to pop off the nub from the rock and to create a bowl that you see in the middle um, and then those uh, pieces of soapstone could also be made into figurines um, as this whale is shown and the little canoes and um, in the lower left hand corner these are called stones you look like helicans but we actually really don't know what they were used for a lot of the soapstone that we see in southern california is actually from santa catalina island and there's been a number of people that have done um, analysis to see the chemical signatures of the various objects that are in museums and it's coming from Catalina Island. Um, just to let you know, Catalina Island is a sacred island to the Gabrieleno Tonga. And so that might explain why our steatite was used um, so far and wide. Also, the Gabrieleno Tonga didn't have pottery until the mission period when the missionaries taught us how to use pottery because we had our soapstone bowls to use and we cooked in them and they retained heat uh, really well. So when we had to do boiling for a long time, that's what we used. And one of the reasons why we never um, created pottery on our own. 
Um, and so those are just a few things um, that I wanted to bring about in terms of life in the villages. One of the things we're trying to do now is identify one of the things when you see in the archaeological litter, they always focus on men's activities and the importance of men. And they always hunted and they did the fishing and they did all of this stuff, which in fact discounts the roles of women within the community. And so this is a picture of four ancestor poles that were just recently installed at the Autry Museum of the American West in its Imagining Wests exhibit. And it was created by Tiat Society, which is our maritime organization that, and they have allowed, graciously allowed the Autry to show these. And when somebody has passed in our community after a year, we have a mourning ceremony. And Sometimes the families will erect a pole in honor of the memory of those individuals. And so we chose four strong female individuals within our history. Toy Perina, who um, was the person who led a revolt or tried to lead a revolt at uh, Mission San Gabriel to um, combat the, the destructive practices that they had on the community while they were at the mission. Uh, Victoria Reed was the chief, uh, the daughter of a chief, and she married Hugo Reed, who's well known for documenting our community practices in the Los Angeles Star newspaper in the 1850s. Juana Maria, which is the Christian name that was given to the woman who was rescued from San Nicolas Island, who Bob had previously talked about and who passed in 1853, and Narcissa Rosemeyer, who again, Bob also uh, uh, talked about and who's gave a lot of information regarding the Gabrielino Tongva people, particularly our language. Um, we wanted to celebrate these these strong women and to remind us that it's that it's in order to survive, it takes the whole community, men, women, and children in order to go on. And so this is a picture of our community today. I had a really great experience this weekend being at Corona Springs all weekend. We've created a basketry collective where we're relearning our coiled basketry um, uh, activities. And we just completed our first year. And for the first time, we've had Tongva basket weavers in over 150 years. And the upper right hand corner is all of our uh, basket weavers. And so there's about 25 of us for the first time in so long. So I thank you all for listening to me and thank you. The Springs were, uh, as I say, they were rescued originally by uh, the foundation in 1992. And for many years, uh, basically the efforts of um, Angie Barron's uh, it was fairly well managed and there were events and the museum was created in this uh, building, but sadly uh, uh, the site was slowly falling into disrepair. And um, starting in 2019, uh, we got involved, I got involved with, the, with my sons and the Boy Scout troop to embark on a restoration of the actual, uh, the site, the grounds, the land following the recommendations of the task force to remove the invasive non-native plants and to um, reestablish native plants. Next slide, please. This was the condition of the lower pond. You can see a surface of water. It's only three inches deep. Uh, there were 16 inches of sediment and sludge that had accumulated over the previous perhaps 60 years, um, which uh, became, it would eventually become a meadow if it was cleaned out. These are concrete line ponds built in the 1930s. And you can see the willows uh, falling into the water and surrounded basically by uh, invasive Algerian ivy. Next slide, please. This is the drain where 56,000 gallons of fresh, clean water every day that which emerges from the earth flows through the ponds and empties into this storm drain at the top of Stoner Avenue. In the background, you can see the YMCA building that was built on school property in 2015 and the gym of University High School. And those are students walking back and forth. But you can see the condition of the invasives, the, uh, the papyrus and uh, the other plants that have just taken over and obscured you know, the actual um, uh, layout of the, of the springs and, and the infrastructure. Next slide. So we came up with a plan. This is the two acre site showing uh, 
the origin of the spring on the left side and the pools of water that it flows through and ultimately into the storm drain. And our goal was to recreate the village uh, up in the upper right. There's a, a, an image of the key to the far right is the horticultural garden. The lower right is our medicine garden. And in that blank space in the middle is the school agricultural classroom that was built in the 60s that is now our cultural center and museum. And we have an amphitheater in the upper left, which was a result of uh, Tom Hayden's efforts, uh, among others. And uh, our goal is to rewild the entire site. Next slide. Uh, one of the first things that we wanted to do to reintroduce native creatures, we had to somehow deal with the non-native invasive crayfish. Uh, they burrow. You can see their holes on the right side. The problem is they will eat the eggs of our native creatures, uh, the chub, the frogs, the tadpoles. So um, we made an effort to, uh, to uh, eradicate the crayfish. Next slide. Uh, one of the things we needed to do in order to clean out the ponds was to divert the water flow around the ponds so we could dry them out. Uh, this shows the entire flow of our spring, known as uh, seep number three, our, our spring on the grounds. Uh, we were able to measure this with a five gallon bucket and a stopwatch and uh, took seven and a half seconds to fill a five gallon bucket for you mathematicians out there that adds up to 56,000 gallons a day. And we have this water tested and it's exceptionally pure. Next slide. These are the ponds in the process of cleaning them out. We had to pump out the water. You can see the 14 inches of sludge on the left side. As the water drained out, the crayfish were uh, consumed by all the other predators on the site, the raccoons, the coyotes, the possums, the birds. Um, we, uh, next slide. This is the process of cleaning out the muck. On the right side, you can see the pile of sludge and sediment that was uh, that was taken from the pond. We had to clean out uh, all of the debris, broken glass, old, gla old sunglasses, CD cases, watches, jewelry, stuff that falls into the water. Uh, and we were able to spread this uh, muck out, work it in with our soil and create incredible rich uh, soil for our natives. And uh, next slide. These are the ponds completely cleaned out. Uh, we wanted to dry them out to try to eradicate the crayfish. So they were like this for four months as we went and did uh, the rest of the uh, cleanup. You can see the little excavator over there. And after four months, I figured these crayfish, they're gone. There's no way they could survive this condition. So we uh, refilled the ponds again. You can see the fence that separates us from the uh, high school and uh, their fake artificial turf on that side. Please, uh, next slide. We successfully cleaned out the ponds, filled them with spring water, and we were able to introduce our native arroyo chub. These are threatened, endangered minnows that used to live throughout the Los Angeles basin. Uh, they're thriving in our pond now. Next slide. Uh, the rest of the site needed a good clean up, we had to bring in some heavy equipment to remove the dead trees, the uh, uh, Algerian ivy, and uh, we uncovered uh, lots of concrete, sidewalks, uh, other infrastructure that the school had built. That white building in the back was the continuation school called Indian Springs Continuation School. That is a bungalow, LAUSD bungalow, put there in the early 70s, I believe. There's not a single window in this building. It's unusable and it has been vacant for 10 years. It's on a piece of land on the corner, which is considered surplus land. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. This is another view from the top of our little shed showing the massive compost pile of all the invasive plants that we ground up and regenerated into the soil. And you can see the problem with this sanctuary having a, a four-story building looming over it. So we decided to first plant um, on this side of the alley to get a screen going uh, as soon as possible. Next slide. And we did a lot of this work. Most of this work was with uh, volunteer labor. Uh, the Theater Payne Foundation brought in lots of native plants. You can see there's Boy Scouts on the right putting in yerba mansa and anamopsis and carex panza along the edge. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, 
This is one of our uh, members of the community, Mercedes, and her lovely daughter, Imogene, planting a manzanita. Next slide. Uh, this is preparing the soil, mixing up that rich uh, sludge that we reclaimed from the pond into the earth and preparing uh, planting beds around this, uh, around our key. And you can see the results six months later on the right. Native poppies. Next slide. This is the return of our native flora. On the left, we have the uh, white sage, salviapiana, and there's the uh, a royal willow, and in the background is our uh, beautiful regal Taxodium macronatum, the, Mount, the uh, Montezuma cypress, which happens to be the state champion. On the right side, there's deer grass and uh, white alder growing in a new riparian zone, which is flooded with spring water. Uh, and the fence, you can see we actually added wood lattice to screen us off, get us some uh, privacy from the school. And climbing over the fence are uh, native Anacapa morning glory. Next slide. This just kind of shows the allure and the magic of the of, and the beauty of the springs and uh, the coming back of our native plants. Next slide. This is a, a view from the medicine garden, uh, which is full of different kinds of sages. And uh, there's yucca, there's datura. Um, and uh, it's, it is just taken off with very little care, actually no care, just leave it be with uh, the native soil and the sun. Um, it just has uh, uh, spectacular, uh, immense growth of vegetation. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a view from early in the year showing the flowering of the sugar bush and the uh, uh, lemonade berry with sycamores in the, in the foreground, the background, are non-native exotic trees planted by the school 70 years ago. Next slide. And this just shows a uh, one of our tree frogs that we reintroduced and they're thriving in the uh, delightful clean uh, habitat that has been recreated for them. And the thing about native plants, there's a whole web of nature. Today, we saw so many different kinds of butterflies, uh, dragonflies. They, uh, there's a support system with between the plants and the animals and us. Next slide. Some of our partners in the restoration, uh, UCLA, the botanical gardens, they were the ones that were able to engrave our plant labels. Uh, Natural History Museum was involved in uh, many of the plantings. Theodore Payne Foundation supplied a lot of plants, the Boy Scouts, community volunteers, the members of the Tongva community, of course, and the Prisk Native Gardens in Long Beach. Next slide. So we have to, in order to build a real village, we needed to build a key. And um, we've never done this before. Uh, I've seen replicas of keys in different areas. They're built of rebar or plastic pipe. We wanted to do the real thing. So we collected materials from the site. We created an elevated mound and we found the right spot and we had a blessing. Next slide. Um, and we laid it out in a 12 inch diameter circle. We carved a trench, filled it with spring water to level it out, popped in the holes. And the next day we erected our frame. Next slide. This shows the, the group putting it together. Uh, we use branches. We didn't have enough willow. We use branches from a from a ficus tree, a actual uh, rubber tree, and uh, you'll see what happens. Uh, come uh, next slide, please. Next, this is the the joy of of building your own shelter. Next slide. This. Uh, the use of spring water, uh, which we're uh, able to move with solar powered pump, uh, we created, it looks like a moat, but it's really a way to level out the earth around the key to create a planting area. But uh, I love this with the setting sun and the water in our key. Next. This is preparing the tule. Uh, uh, you can not only make boats with tule, but you can thatch your key with it. This tule was Basically, it's a California giant bulrush, a giant reed that used to grow wild throughout all the streams of, of the area. Now it's uh, it's hard to find, but we did source this from the uh, Biona wetlands, the freshwater marsh. 
And uh, they were able to bundle it, bundle it up, and we got the Boy Scouts to transport it, and community members to to do the uh, to do the thatching. Next, so this is the inside, which I think it feels like a basket, and I love it. But you can see the limbs of the rubber tree actually uh, <laughs> they took they they came back to life, and uh, a lot of our uh, ribs of this of this key are actually uh, living living wood now and uh, I think it's remarkable maybe it'll give us another 10 years um, as we uh, enjoy this and rethatch it over the years but this is a, a delightful shot from the inside next slide please so one of the task force recommendations was to use the spring water for irrigation instead of letting it all go down the drain uh, we found a company that sold us a, a, a solar panels and a solar pump you can see on the right, and we were able to divert some of the spring water into a uh, six inch pipe where we pump spring water directly where we like it throughout the site. Next slide. Uh, this is showing our efforts at the Mesoamerican garden, we like to call it, uh, based on corn, beans, and squash. Although the Tongva were not necessarily corn farmers or agricultural, they were, as Desiree pointed out, horticulturalists. And I think they delighted in moving plants around. And of course they had an intimate connection with, with every type of plant that grew in this area. And yes, it's true, the banana trees are not native and nor is the giant bamboo we see on the right, but because we have a connection with our Polynesian uh, uh, neighbors and we are also oceanic people uh, and we needed to screen off the apartment building as quickly as possible and the giant bamboo is very useful for uh, construction and who doesn't love bananas? These all require lots and lots of water. They love it here because we can supply them with unlimited quantities of fresh spring water. Next slide. This is the group of UCLA students getting their feet in the mud. And uh, uh, this was a class that David Shorter had, Healing and Transformation. And they wrote letters later after this experience which lasted, I think, six weeks, uh, and uh, expressing how they were healed and transformed by getting their feet in that slushy mud. Next slide. Uh, a few months later, he just add some sun and water, and some of this corn grew 16 feet tall. Next slide. Next slide. And uh, we do get a harvest, watermelon. Next slide. And of course, uh, Kuruvunga is about community and bringing people together. The word uh, translates as place where we are in the sun. We have visitors from all over the world, uh, visitors from the local community. This was a group uh, uh, that were uh, towing a giant totem pole around the country and they made a stop. They couldn't get the totem pole through our gates, but they came and uh, did a blessing with our beautiful spring water. Next slide. These are the release of the native tadpoles in our uh, in our pond with our chub, showing the newly painted cultural museum or cultural center and museum in the background. We repurpose the old agricultural building, and now uh, we do use this for uh, artifacts or displays and for gatherings. Next slide. This was a, a, a visit with the San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians last year for a small gathering in honor of our uh, volunteers and supporters. And we plan on doing more of these events in the future. So uh, keep in touch. Next slide. These are uni high students doing a cleanup. And here you can sort of see the clarity of the water and if you look if it was actual video you'd see the water bubbling up through the sand in the bottom next slide so this is today this is what we have uh this is the actual corner of barrington in ohio that little chunk of land that is uh, part of our village but fenced off chained off barricaded um, it was called indian springs community day school um, it is no longer being used by the by the school district. And we are working with the school district to try and uh, create outdoor programming. And we would like to uh, 
He had a long-term lease, much like the YMCA was able to do to get this piece of land. Please, uh, next slide. This is a jumble of maps, but it shows the spring surrounded by red uh, in the map. That corner with the yellow outline in those two bungalows is the is the uh, uh, the abandoned buildings of the continuation school. And uh, you can see our parking lot that is actually shared with Uni High. We don't have exclusive rights to that, but it's not used very much except for film crews that like to use University High School for filming. And that is another uh, point of friction. However, um, uh, I think that we are in really, uh, have a really good relationship now with Uni High and with LAUSD. Next slide. So this shows the upper spring. There are actually two springs. This is on the campus of Uni High up above the girls athletic field. And uh, below that cypress tree, there is another spring, which you can see on the right has been uh, captured by a six inch tube and piped directly into the storm drain. Because in 2015, they did water analysis. They found trace amount of a dry cleaning uh, uh, fluid that comes from the dry cleaners up on Wilshire. Trace amount, we're talking 11 parts per billion. The drinking water that the kids are drinking has more stuff in it. But um, this was a temporary measure by the school. We're trying to get this resurfaced so we can free the springs. We're working with the environmental club of Uni High and the students to get them uh, active and uh, take direct action and release the springs. That's our that's our goal with the uh, with uh, working together with Uni High. Next slide. These are the uh, two abandoned bungalows, uh, the continuation school, which uh, we are hoping to uh, remove the buildings and expand the native green, the native plants. I think the city could use more uh, more open space and more more green and uh, a place where the local community can come and visit and enjoy as well. Next slide. This is the situation we see today. We're, we will be able to take uh, a lot of the water that's going down the drain now and bring it up to this part of the property to uh, reestablish uh, native riparian zones and oak forests and create a micro forest for the, uh, for the natives. Next slide, please. This is a this is a concept uh, of the reuse of that site, showing a new cultural center museum, moving the one away from the springs, relocating it up uh, where that area we call the basin, which we can create uh, another pond using all the water that's flowing down the drain and our solar power to go off the grid. You can see the uh, the wetlands, the core, the mountains, the village. It's a spirited uh, ideation uh, of concept of what could what could be done with this uh, urban brown brown lot next slide so this is what it looks today what it looks like today as you look up Barrington you see the Barrington Plaza up on the right and a new skyscraper recently completed up there on Wilshire uh, the reason why that hill ramps up so so fast there is because of the earthquake fault that uh, is um, is what uh, causes our springs to uh, come up from the aquifer. Um, would be interesting to see this 200 years ago, what it looked like, and maybe we'll be able to recreate that. Next slide. This is the same corner uh, showing what could happen using our spring water, using our, our knowledge of the plants and, and, and our knowledge of construction of the key. Um, and uh, to have a place where everybody is welcome and people can come and learn about the Tongva and learn about uh, the people that have always been here and that are still here. Next slide. Thank you very much. This is uh, the pitch. We're a nonprofit. We need your help. We're trying to create a, uh, a war chest so we can we can go toe to toe with LAUSD and uh, 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 come up with a, um, proposal to to really uh, uh, address that unused piece of land that's on our site. So we need your help. All the funds to go directly into improving the site. We don't have any paid staff yet. It's all volunteers. They're also open to the public the first Saturday of every month from 10 to 3 and everybody's welcome. 
you can go directly to our webpage, GabrielaniusSprings.com, and bring your credit card and please donate. Um, we need your help and support. This is a vital part of our community. This is a cultural treasure for everybody. And um, I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to bring it to everyone's attention. And hopefully we'll see you at the Springs uh, in the next few weeks. Thank you. Libby, I'm gonna give it back to you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. All right, let's go back. Uh, do We do have some questions and okay. uh, we'll go as long as we can. Uh, Desiree, are you still with us? I'm sure that there are, let's get back to that one that, that we were talking about. Uh, this one had to do with the uh, intercommunication among uh, uh, villages, especially going as far north as Santa Barbara and southeast to, to Palm Springs. And uh, when did these villagers, villagers become threatened by outsiders? Yeah, basically, there was a lot of travel in between villages, particularly long distances. And a lot of it had to do with ceremonies. So not only did you have near villages come together um, within Tongva land to go and collect, for instance, acorns, etc. But there was also puberty ceremonies, ceremonies that acknowledge the transformation from child to adult. Or like I had stated before, mourning ceremonies where you um, had a gathering of people to acknowledge the anniversary of a death of a community leader. And we do have information showing that um, if there was a particular leader from a, a village, there was gifts or you would go and attend the ceremony or if you couldn't attend yourself, um, you would send a gift for that recognition. So the last leader of the Ago Cayente Cahuilla, uh, who were in Palm Springs, had within his medicine bundle, bundle a string of Santa Catalina Island beads that had come off from Catalina, documented that they were at San Gabriel, and then went over and were given on behalf of um, the leaders on Catalina in recognition of the passing of a great leader within the Agua Cayente community. And so although they couldn't do it themselves, they passed it from village to village and it then was brought over. So there was the, um, there was travel long distances because of either the celebration or the recognition of um, the various uh, uh, either uh, recognition of the passing of a, of a leader or the celebration of um, communities, you know, uh, going on to the next stage of life, but also could include marriages as well. Thank you. Um, what was the system of justice? Uh, if there were undoubtedly were, were arguments among people and disagreements, uh, how did the, uh, how did the, the Tonga deal with all that? Um, there is a little bit of information about that. And a lot of the times it was the leader that, of the village that was part of a larger community or council. Um, and those were made up of people that were recognized within the community to be res have um, respect because of their wisdom or knowledge, sometimes even their age, you would hear about uh, council of elders. So those people that were older in age and were respected for their decision making. They would, um, if there was arguments between families, you would go to the head of the family first um, to see if you could, you know, do something about it. And then you would go to this, could go to this larger council. Um, this is kind of what we believe occurred based on what was being recorded at contact and a little bit after, and then also looking at how people um, within our our cousin communities also uh, dealt with these types of issues. Thank you. Uh, Bob, this is, has to do with you. Uh, are there classes or uh, cooking moments when the the harvest can be used to, to prepare uh, perhaps um, not pure Tongva meals, but something like that? Well, it's something we've been talking about because we all love food and we want to uh, actually today we were talking with Abe Sanchez um, about uh, trying to prepare uh, a meal using, you know, Tongva base. And there are community members that do that. There's a Chia cookbook, which uses a lot of the local native ingredients. Um, but it's something that uh, we're very interested in working forward toward. We haven't done any formal classes yet at the Springs. 
but I could see that as part of our educational program, especially when it comes to harvesting all of the uh, cool, wonderful plants that are growing now at the springs, the cattails, the tules, the elderberry, the lemonade berry. There's a, most of the plants in, the, in, this, in this land are actually edible if you know how to process them properly, like Desiree was talking about. So uh, it's something that's on our agenda to look at. And uh, once again, we're gonna, we're gonna um, uh, let you know right. when that's gonna happen. And we'll invite you and we can make some acorn tortillas and maybe eat some squirrel. <laughs> yeah, plenty of squirrels uh, in the springs. One other quick question for you, Bob. Uh, going back to the grounding up of the Tongva by the uh, mission builders, I noticed in the we noticed in the picture that there was a key that was still on the land. Did the Tongva continue to live uh, as they had as the missions were being constructed? I believe there was probably quite a bit of overlap. I think a lot of the natives were uh, uh, were interested. I would say in maybe checking out what's going on with these strangers. Um, and I think yes, because the mission was built like the city of LA and most of these cities were built on sites of villages. So that key that's, that is represented in that, you know, it, it was an, uh, a German artist that did that. Who knows if it was really like that. He, he would have, I don't think Mount Baldy looked quite that close <laughs> to the mission and the palm tree that's behind that key is not a native palm. It's a, that's a uh, Canary Island date palm, uh, which is probably 50 years old. So that painting was executed and I believe 1834. So I would like to think that the Tonga were still practicing their native ways, or at least a, uh, groups of them, and building keys and living like that. But it's really, it's hard to know what it was like exactly then. We do have records, but it, it seems like slowly or maybe rapidly, the culture was engulfed. Um, and then quite rapidly after that, it became engulfed in the city of Los Angeles. So some people consider the Tongva urban Indians, which I don't know if that's pejorative, but uh, it's the way it is. It's all been covered with concrete, except for Kutavungna. It's really one of the few places left um, that uh, that brings us back to what it could have been like in the past. Uh, uh, there are two questions here. Uh, what is the status of recognition for the Tongva? And where is... Uh, is the language being um, taught to certain groups or is the language uh, just not? I'm going to, I think Desiree would be. Okay. Desiree, both. what about the uh, recognition part and, and uh, what about the language? So there's a number of different ways that the Gabrielino Tongva can be um, recognized. One of them is going through the recognition process through the uh, Bureau of, of Recognition through the government. And that's a little bit harder for us. And we've been trying to be doing that for a number of years. There are three different bands. There's currently seven different Gabrielino and um, Tongva bands that are uh, alive and well here in Southern California. Three of them are currently on that list. However, there are seven criteria that a tribe has to um, meet in order to go through that process. And one of them is to show that you have been continuously met, meeting as a tribe with a chief and a council, et cetera. And it has to be documented and you have to have an outside entity have recognized you throughout that time. Um, when the recognition process first started in 1978, you had to have proved that when California first became a state in 1850, um, Revisions to it has now moved it to 1900, but because of colonization, because of missionization, they're really in, because history is um, written by the victors and a lot of our community hid in plain sight, um, we don't have a lot of those records to show continuous meeting as a community, even though we did. So it's gonna be really hard for not only us, but a lot of other non federally recognized tribes in California to meet those criteria. There can also be an act of Congress. Congress can bestow um, recognition upon the community, um, as well as um, having, the, like one of the tribes in California did going through and having the Department of the Interior recognize 
that they were never not recognized and saying, oh, they got off the list and then put them back on the recognition list. But it's really hard and it's something that the community has been working for since the 1990s, but it takes a lot of time and money to do that. Mm -hmm. um, as for the second question, there are a number of people that have been trying to reconstitute the language, um, starting from the lists that are written by a number of anthropologists and ethnologists and linguists, um, C. Hart Merriam, um, Harrington, for instance, We've been working with UCLA linguist Pam Monroe for at least 20 years. Um, there is a language group that are trying to create and have a dictionary actually, and then looking to our sister tribes who have a similar language um, to us to create words for those things in our um, that are around us that we um, don't know what they are. So there are a number of people that are trying to um, relearn. There's a number of songs in our language that we sing. There's a number of prayers. Uh, people are starting to try to have conversations, but nowhere near the fluency of other communities. Thank you. Well, I think at this point, uh, we will call the Q&A portion of the program over. And I want to thank you three, not you three, you two, for your participation in that part. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Rob Schwenker, who will have a few words to say about the Santa Monica History Museum. Thanks, Libby. Uh, thanks to Desiree, Bob. Um, what an incredibly engaging uh, and educational program. I certainly learned a lot. Everyone else did too. Um, thanks to, to Libby and Steve for, as always, uh, producing uh, such a wonderful program and, and for Adina for all of her help on the tech side. Um, I want to thank everybody um, at the Santa Monica Conservancy um, board, led by Tom Cleese, staff, led by Caitlin Drisco, everybody there. Um, you know, we uh, there we we consider consider ourselves good friends of the Conservancy at the museum, um, and and I know vice versa. So, uh, thanks so much for allowing us to to be part of this and to collaborate on this. It's wonderful uh, to collaborate with everyone at the Conservancy. Um, I'm a member of the Santa Monica Conservancy. I think that everybody who's a member of the Santa Monica History Museum should be a member of the Santa Monica Conservancy. And I think that um, everyone who's a member of the Santa Monica Conservancy ought to be a member of the Santa Monica History Museum. I think we have some slides. So um, one of the things that um, you can see right now at the Santa Monica History Museum is our featured exhibition. It's called Coming Out West, LGBTQ Elders Share Their Stories. Among these incredible people um, is a member of the Tongva Gabrieleño community um, called El Frank. Um, eight remarkable individuals. Um, and the, the exhibition is presented uh, entirely well, almost entirely, uh, digitally via oral history. So you walk up uh, to a wall panel um, in our main gallery and you place a set of headphones on like these and uh, you hear someone tell you their story and share with you their experience being a member of the LGBTQ plus community um, here on the West Side. And we also have a number of artifacts um, from the individuals that are featured in the exhibition. And we put that all into the context of LGBTQ plus history. So if you haven't seen this exhibit, please come to the museum and check it out. Um, certainly uh, worth uh, uh, an, an afternoon. Next. And uh, we are really excited to be back in person for our annual fundraising event this year. We've had uh, a digital fundraising uh, event the last three years. Um, as we've shared this collective pandemic experience. Um, and we're really excited to be back in person this year for an event that we've rebranded as Stand Ups for History. Um, we're going to honor Misty Kearns, uh, who's a longtime uh, president and CEO of Santa Monica Travel and Tourism and has contributed so much to our community. It's going to be really fun. Uh, stand up comedy, music, um, and we're going to announce in the coming weeks some amazing uh, local restaurant partners. So you're going to be well fed. You're going to be well hydrated. You're going to have a really good time. Um, and all for uh, the Santa Monica History Museum, which is entirely 
uh, donor supported. So um, you can find tickets at santamonicahistory.org. Hope to see you on Sunday, October the 1st at the Santa Monica Bay Women's Club for a really fun evening. I think we have one more. If you want to learn more, go to our website, santamonicahistory.org. This is where you can become a member of the museum. This is where you can make a donation. This is where you can find out a little bit more about Stand Ups for History. Again, thank you to all of our friends at the Santa Monica Conservancy for continuing to put on these programs um, and, uh, and enrich our community. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for the collaboration with the museum this year on our Mosaic Lecture Series. It's a great relationship. I want to thank our speakers, Bob and Desiree, a fabulous program, uh, extraordinarily interesting. And a reminder that the second part of the Sacred Springs celebration is coming up on Sunday, September 10th, with a pair of in-person tours of the Springs. Tours will be at 10 and 11 a.m. And this uh, today's speaker, Bob Ramirez, is going to direct current events to restore, talk about current events to restore the Native ecology. And tours will also be presented by the tribal elder Angie Behrens, who pioneered the campaign to rescue and, and uh, restore the site. Um, I also want to thank, uh, acknowledge Libby, Ruth Ann Lair, and Steve Loper and Adina for putting this program on. It's an extraordinary volunteer effort, and we thank you so much. A uh, couple final notes. Uh, something in the news of late is uh, discussion about the uh, the uh, Civic Auditorium. The city has put it up as surplus land. This begins a state mandated process for interested governmental agencies to make proposals for the acquisition of the property. The school district, Santa Monica Malified, Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District is considering making a proposal which is due to the city in September. We're following the matter closely and been having many meetings with stakeholders in the community. Our key focus here is that the landmark is preserved and brought back to life to serve the community. It's a complicated issue, uh, but we're working closely and we'll be reporting back to you more about that. Uh, finally, we're winding up our 20th anniversary celebration that'll occur this fall. Uh, our holiday party, we're going to combo our holiday party and this celebration should be an event on December 2nd at the church in Ocean Park, which is now the ceilings and are being restored after damage. And we'll get to celebrate with them the reopening of that facility. So we're excited about that. And again, thank you for all the attendees for joining us today. Uh, Rob mentioned, please join the Conservancy as well as the History Museum. You can go to our website, smconservancy.org, and either join as a member or contribute so we can continue making these programs possible. Again, thank you all for attending. Have a great evening. <laughs>